Ah, uh, hi, and uh, well, good morning at the or good afternoon, really. Anyway, today is uh, Saturday, the twenty eighth of May, twenty sixteen, and um, as many could tell right up front, I have nothing written down or not scripted. I'm not. I uh, haven't got any great notes about things that I want to talk about, and I'm going to try and be uh, reasonably brief about it but um, it's one of those issues and subjects and whatever that um, takes a bit of explanation um, I have decided to do something that I hadn't really found um, adequately on uh, YouTube um, and straight away you'd say what are you talking about everything's on YouTube well it is of course it is but um, uh, without getting all gooey or mugashi or um, carrying on about um, God or anything else, I just simply feel as if I'm, well, I know that I'm extremely blessed to be alive and well um, and to be able to record all this and discuss this with my friends. Some of them are personal friends and uh, I won't name them and some of them are people who uh, just might be interested in the subject and may view it. Um, I have had a, a one uh, near-death experience as a child and uh, I was a, I think eight or ten and I nearly drowned in the Arrow River in Melbourne. I was saved uh, from that but in the meantime I, as the saying goes, I was going went down three times and I went up twice in other words I was going to die and uh, I suddenly I saw a silver uh, tunnel all around me looking up at the sky it was just quite extraordinary I was quite young as I said I was totally shocked about this <coughs> and there was a man there in a white cloak and he basically showed me my whole life in front of me just zap and he and uh, I told, it wasn't a guilt trip or anything like that, and I wasn't a Christian. I wasn't any. I didn't have any religion. In fact, my mother described me uh, as a young boy as a agnostic. It took me years to understand what the word agnostic actually meant. And uh, he said, "Do you want to live?" And I just blacked out. Yes, yes, I do. And I got the water pumped out of me. And by the way, I was uh, one statistically. I was probably uh, uh, close to. Uh, the one ten percent of people who get saved by um, um, CPR um, having the water pumped out of them, or I didn't have. I just had. I just had the um, whether I had the full uh, CPR or not. I'm not quite sure, but I was very lucky to be alive. Anyway, I had that experience. I told my parents about it, and they said, "Oh no, no, you're having a. You had a, 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 a hallucination." And I just uh, brushed that aside and not worried about that for some years. And then I read a book by Dr. Moody called Life After Life, where thousands of uh, NDEs, they're called near-death experiences, were investigated. And it was re revealed, basically, that they are real. Now, um, I, as it turns out, let's say fast forward many, many years, I well, was uh, being treated for very serious cancer at a massive operation I had in 2007 actually it was a 13 year 13, sorry 13 hour operation anyway I was having radiation treatment and I seeing in the doctor's you know surgery let's say for an appointment to talk about these things and I saw a time magazine and it said what happens to us when we die and it didn't have one word about God or faith or anything else it just had a whole series of uh, cases that would have stood up in court. I'll give you a quick outline of three of them to give you an illustration that it's not a person's imagination. It's not all in their mind uh, that they had this experience. Now, one case was a woman, in all, they all had died on the operating table. So, what happened to one woman? She left her body, she went up through the ceiling of the hospital she went up above the roof of the hospital actually while they were frantically working on her you know um, giving her the um, 
uh, the shock treatment, they, they call it. Um, anyway, I'll come to me in a minute. And she, lo and behold, she saw a single sand shoe on the roof. And she suddenly, you know, she went back into her body. And they said, uh, you know, just say the next day, for example, how, how, did you, how are you going? And, oh, I'm going fine. Um, I had a very strange experience, though. I left my body and I went up above the hospital and I saw a sand shoe on the roof and they kind of nervously laughed it off a bit and, huh, okay, huh, that's interesting. And uh, one of them made a decision, look we'll up on the roof and, you know, we'll, we'll prove that this is all in her imagination. It sounds a bit silly, you know, so they sent somebody up on the roof and the, and the person held the sand shoe above his head and said, look, here's the sand shoe. They go, oh, gee. This really did occur. Then there was another occasion. There's two two others of great, uh, 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 shall I say, extraordinary uh, uh, evidence. There was a blind man, and uh, he had been blind all of his life, absolutely from birth, blind, right? Couldn't see a thing. So he had this operation, and anyway, then he died. Well, sure enough, he, he, his spirit left his body. He went to the ceiling, he turned upside down on the ceiling, at the ceiling, and could see for the first time in his life. And there they were, bringing him back, so to speak, bringing him back uh, using the, um, my mind's gone blank on the court, what they're called, um, uh, zapping him, so to speak, like you see in Hollywood. Uh, well, you know, zap, clear, zap, clear, and so on. Um, anyway. He went back into his body. And of course, the next day, they'd say, well, how are you going? You know, oh, oh I'm going fine, Doc. Well, look, I tell you what, strange thing happened to me. I left my body. <coughs> I went to the ceiling and turned upside down. I could see the first time in my life. And I could see all the doctors working frantically and bringing me back. And sure enough, I did go back. So they were quite astounded. That's amazing. There was another occasion where a guy had um, died on the operating table. And then they, uh, uh, they, they, they did everything they could to save him. They thought, well, he has died. We can't, can't do anything about this. And there was a tall doctor and a short doctor. And the, they were both standing in the, in the doorway you know, of the operating theatre. One had his arms crossed like so, and he said, Words to the effect, you know, uh, oh, it was very unfortunate that we lost old Harry, you know, and uh, very sad situation there and so forth. And, and the short doctor was just, you know, concurring with that. And, oh, yes, well, you know, from what I could see, he was a pretty good guy and blah, 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 blah. Well, in the meantime, the paper was still flowing onto the floor from that machine, you know, like you have an EEG type, like, you know, a monitoring machine. <coughs> and then... He turned around and said, oh, well, oh, you better go and turn that machine off, you know. And they go over to turn the machine off, and uh, they said, oh, look, there's a heartbeat. Old Harry must be, you know, he's still, <laughs> still alive. So they worked on him, and they brought uh, the guy back. I don't know if you know what I'm saying, Harry, but, you know. <laughs> they brought him back, and, of course, got him back and treated him, and then they, they, they would have asked him later, well, um, how you going? Well, usual, right? He said, oh, I'm fine. Look, I'll tell you what. Oh, gee, I, I, I left my body and I saw a monitor. I, I describe it as a TV screen, you know. And it had these little post posters, you know, little yellow stickers down the one side of it, you know, ring Susie, you know, ring do this and do that. And then I saw you and I saw this other doctor, you know, and they were standing in the doorway and you had your arms crossed and you were saying, Gee, it's unfortunate we lost old Harry. Well, they were totally floored by this, totally stunned by this. And you know, this is uh, uh, something they had to report. So they had three very, very clear, uh, verifiable um, NDEs. And about, incidentally, this coming out of the body and re turning upside down and seeing what's going on happened to me at one time. Uh, 
and I was totally astounded. I could see through my arm, of course, I'm, I'm up against the ceiling, and I'm thinking, oh, oh, gee, if I don't get back into my body, I'm going to die. And I went back in my body, and I remember it extremely well. I was only a kid of quite young age. I went right back in between my eyes, went zap into my body. And actually, as it turns out, I had a very, very serious illness at the time. In fact, it was uh, meningitis. Uh, and people, oh, that's your imagination. And, uh, you know, maybe, but I don't think so. You know, I remember it was just, just terrified at the time. So my um, out-of-body experience can't be quite compared to the ones I just described. Now we move on to uh, the subject, uh, which some of my friends, by the way, are I have Christian friends, and they won't take any notice of uh, the subject of UFOs and aliens. And oh no, no, Johnny, no, uh, God didn't. There's nothing mentioned about this in the Bible, uh, so it can't be right, you know, and. Uh, no, no, I need, one One friend says, oh, I need two independent witnesses. Totally independent witnesses, and I'll believe the story, and now they, they tell me quite sincerely, well, I saw this flying disc, and this happened, and that happened. Well, as I've said, well, even though I'm a Christian, I've said, well, I don't know how, how you're going to get two independent witnesses of Jesus. Oh, of course you can't, you know, of course you can't, it's 2,000 years ago. And that's right, you, all you've got is a book. It's called the Bible. As it turns out, I accept that, you know, but uh, and I only came to being a Christian as an adult. Oh, oh well, you know, there's so many witnesses. I said, oh, yeah, that's right. And uh, this is completely true. Uh, uh, other uh, people, um, uh, one person that comes to mind, and you can, of course, uh, uh, always um, check this out on YouTube and other places, uh, Google and so on, is a man called Lee Strobel. Now, he wrote a book, The Case for Christ, uh, quite an astounding book, well-researched, and he told his story. And if you want a, a short version, in other words, a 45-minute video, that's what you can find on YouTube. Now, he said, I was a drunkard, I was uh, a violent person, and uh, um, my little daughter, a toddler daughter at the time, would hear me coming home, and she'd pile up her blocks or whatever she was playing with him head off to a room is daddy going to get violent again today and is he going to kick a hole in the wall which he literally did etc etc well all that was happening but his wife was an agnostic person and she had a friend in the uh, same block of apartments and this person was a, a you know a, a christian and talked to her about jesus which was fair enough this is what jesus means to me etc well, lo and behold, as uh, Lee was saying, uh, you know, she, she, she went, went off to church a few times and investigated this and said, gee, um, I'm affected by this. I believe this is to be true. I, I accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. Well, she excitedly told Lee. And Lee said, oh, no. Oh, no. He said, the one word that came in my mind, he said, at the time was the word divorce. Yeah. <laughs> I don't believe in all this rubbish. I'm not accepting my wife to be this. You know, went on with life for a period of time. You don't worry about it. Oh, no, she's become a Christian. Well, lo and behold, he said, one day on Sunday morning, I was sleeping off a hangover. I was laying on the couch. You know, <laughs> my wife was all getting dressed up for church. And <laughs> she's saying, Lee, why don't you come to church with me? And I said, well, you know what? I think I will. So he goes to church. Oh, I'm going to dispel this uh, this cult. Oh, I'll figure out figure out what this is all about, you know. Well, he he thought this was interesting, etc., etc., etc. Oh, but I know, you know, he worked. He was a, a reporter on the uh, a major newspaper in Chicago. I think the Sun Herald or one of the anyway, Sun Times is it or whatever over there. He said, "Oh, they even had a." They even had a sign on the wall, so, you know, like a saying, if your mother says, I love you, investigate it. You know, don't, don't, don't take her word for it. Just look around and see whether this is true. Because they're all laughing. People are giving it a, a, a bit of a, you know, a bit of a speech on this. They're all laughing. Yeah, okay. Cynical. Well, he said, I was cynical. That's, that's the way you're taught as an uh, investigative journalist. 
But he said the more people I investigated, as it were, the more people I interviewed in great detail about this subject convinced me this is actually true. Um, oh, it says, well, something, for example, like, uh, uh, was Jesus, Jesus uh, uh, crucified? I use the term ex executed. Was he executed? Yes, he was. Even people who had no reason to say yes he was I said yes he was okay all right oh what about raised from the dead I'm sure you know raised from the dead you know well quite a number of, of scholars uh, said well yes as a matter of fact there's completely clear evidence that he was raised from dead and he was 500 people witnessed him and these were people who had some of them were his, his followers or you know uh, disciples and some were followers and some were uh, in the Roman times you know some were uh, almost uh, basically enemies uh, and they're all everyone in between shall we say so they said well we, we've got enough evidence that it's actually happened I thought that was quite good and, and you know as a Christian it might sound like I'm being biased but I enjoyed the movie so if you look up uh, Lee Strobel uh, S-T-R-O B-E-L Strobel uh, on, and watch a video. But now getting on to aliens and UFOs, which some of my friends, and as I said, one Christian friend in particular says, no, 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 don't talk to me about it. I don't want to see any videos from YouTube. I don't look at links. Although, well, the way around this, partially, is to talk about subjects you do believe in, but to introduce the other subject and say, well, look, I didn't take this from YouTube as a download. It's very important to point that out. I just literally made a screen capture. I filmed it, and at one point you'll hear some of the phone ringing even. I had to answer the phone and uh, uh, get back onto my recording and so forth. Now, there was a case now 50 years ago where in Westall High School in Melbourne, I remember this, I was only the same age as the kids this occurred to. It was like I was 13 years old, I think. So, 50 years ago, these flying saucers landed or came down near the school and it was total chaos well teachers and students as one, as one teacher said at the time in the interviews about this there's a documentary on it well school was as far as I'm concerned school was over get it there are a lot of witnesses to these craft that came down and then they eventually they flew away and one guy told don't climb the fence and of course the kid climbed the fence he said he put his hand out towards the disc and it was too hot I didn't touch the disc, but I was right there. I was one foot away from the thing, and then it floated along, and then eventually it zoomed up into the air faster than any aircraft. But it was also surrounded by aircraft buzzing the area. Then the Army came, and then the Air Force got involved. And then Channel 9 found out about it and interviewed one of the little girls at the time. My age now, she was 12 and a half years old. And she got detention in school, would you believe? This is the non-event. This is something that never happened. This is part of their imagination. These things don't exist. But you'll get school attention. How dare you talk to the media? She even did an interview with the local newspaper down there, which, to much to my surprise, is still operating. It's called the Danny Nong Journal. Now, all of the evidence, including the film that was made of the interview, and this sounds incredible, but... Journal, people went to go and find this film in the archives, I think Channel 9. Mysteriously, the canister was there, but the film's gone. So, well, that's what we're dealing with, guys. So, I'm, I'm talking about two different things. Uh, let's say, subjects completely, one's, one may say that they're opposed to each other, but they're not. I'm talking about evidence of these things that people need to look at and seriously examine the evidence of things like God and creation and things like aliens and UFOs. Now, as I said, they are seemingly opposing, but they're not. When you, uh, when you finally accept the evidence that before you, a whole new world opens up that you begin to, oh, I think I'll, I'll look a bit further into that. Uh, look into this thing like this Russian one where the, a craft landed in a town. I think 5,000 people came out and saw this craft in broad daylight. And an alien, strange looking alien, about uh, nine feet tall, came out of it. 
he had a kind of, a, I guess, a space suit on, but he had a, there was also a strange, oddball-looking robot there as well. Like something out of science fiction, guys, but uh, it really did happen. And this was a, still the Soviet Union, or still under communism, 1989, and yet it was well reported. Now, you can start off by looking into that, and you can start off by looking into many, many other instances, and you will suddenly realize that, hey, this has been around for quite a while. This, this is this is genuine. This is not a mistaken identity. So on that note, anyway, look, I'd like to leave you to it, and you can watch my extracts as I've, as I've created them, and uh, by all means, make a comment, uh, and, and, and even contact me if you wish, and get some more details. And I'd just like to wish all of my friends and others who are viewing this uh, anywhere in the world, so to speak, on Facebook or on uh, YouTube, uh, all the best, and thank you for listening to my uh, stories. Bye now. Hi, uh, look, this is very unprofessional, I know, but I'm giving you a, a brief uh, screen capture, let's say, of a, a number of issues that uh, are of interest to a lot of people, and uh, I would uh, like to discuss them because I have some personal experiences with the subject. She suddenly found herself floating above her own body in the operating room. She could hear all the doctors talking. She could see herself lying on the operating table. She then recalls going back into her body, and that's the last thing she remembered. But, but, when she awakened from the surgery, she amazed the doctors by telling them what they had been talking about. That's just for beginners, because some people, like Howard Storm, who we interviewed for our Watcher series, had a very intense journey that changed his life forever. But before we get to Howard's testimony, let's explore a few details about NDEs. There are people who do not believe in an afterlife. They believe that once we die, this is it, we're finished. We don't continue on. There is no consciousness after death. In short, nothing. These are the atheists. Then there are others of us who are Christians, who believe in the immortality of the soul. In other words, as the biblical prophetic narrative states, we are born, we live our lives one time, and then we face judgment. However, Eastern religions, particularly Hinduism and Buddhism, believe in the concept of reincarnation. We are born, and then when we die, we come back again as a person, an animal, or even a bug, depending on the good works we accomplished, or if we did actions which were evil. Of course, this goes against what the Bible teaches. As I will remind you, the Bible tells us we are born, we live once, and then comes judgment. Hinduism and Buddhism put the onus of salvation on the individual person, lifting themselves up by their spiritual bootstraps and, in essence, saving themselves through good deeds. You know, before this, I'd spent 20 years in academic neurosurgery. I thought I had a pretty good idea how the brain works and how it generates consciousness. I heard occasional near-death experience stories, and I was certain that there would be some brain explanation. Eben Alexander is a Harvard-trained neurosurgeon. He put his faith in logic, in rational thought. Then, in 2008, he spent seven days in a coma. Now, he's a believer. As a neurosurgeon, has this experience changed your thinking about life? It has totally changed everything about my thinking. Most people have some idea of what happens when we die. If you do indeed believe in heaven, it usually involves white clouds, bright lights, mountain tops. Well, Dr. Alexander is a man of science and of medicine. Well, he says he's been to the other side and now he's back to tell us what it was really like. What you saw, or what you felt, is God. Is that your definition? Yes. Were you a man of faith before this? Before my coma, I had no belief whatsoever in a personal loving God. Adopted as a baby, Eben grew up in a conventionally Christian family. If you would ask me before my coma, 
how much would a patient who was extremely sick and should have died from a severe case of bacterial meningitis, how much would they remember? I would have said nothing. They would not remember a single thing. That all changed when this life-saving surgeon suddenly found himself facing his own mortality. November 10, 2008. It didn't really start off as being very good, did it? No, it was basically like being struck by a freight train. Woke up at 4.30 in the morning, had severe back pain, like nothing I'd ever felt before. It was a very severe meningitis, and the CT scans showed that uh, it coated my entire brain. There wasn't any part of my neocortex that was left unscathed. For seven days, Dr. Alexander was in a coma. He was all but lifeless, completely unconscious. Yet he experienced a consciousness that defied all his years of medical training. Here was this beautiful melody and this light spinning closer and closer. It opened up as a portal into this gorgeous realm that was verdant, uh, waterfalls, colors indescribable, and millions of butterflies flying through, a very ultra-real scene. And then there was a warm breeze blowing through that was like the breath of divine. In the hospital, his doctors were losing hope. My physicians were telling my wife that basically she'd be raising our sons alone. My 10-year-old son, Bob, had heard that, realized it was very bad news, came running into my room, pried my eyes open, Daddy, you're going to be okay. Daddy, you're going to be okay. Daddy, you're going to be okay. As if he said it enough, it would make it true. So your son was calling you back. I had to come back. I had to claw my way up out of that very deep hole and somehow do whatever was necessary. He was pleading with me. On the seventh day, against all odds, Dr. Alexander awoke. By medical standards, he made a miraculously quick recovery. But nagging the doctor was how to explain what he'd felt and seen. Was it just a fantasy before death? Was it your brain basically telling you you're about to die? And it's a nice way of shutting down all the systems and making it a pleasant way to exit. Well, it's very important to remember that I had a severe bacterial meningitis that had uh, greatly damaged and destroyed uh, my neocortex, the part of our brain that makes us human, the part that allows for any kind of conscious experience. So that with that amount of destruction, there was no way to have a dream, a hallucination, a fantasy, a confabulation. Those things could not occur because that part of my brain was gone. It was one vivid image seen by Dr. Alexander that finally convinced him that what he'd experienced was real. There was a beautiful girl beside me on the butterfly wing. I can remember her face so perfectly, these sparkling blue eyes and light brown hair and uh, this loving smile. And she never said a word, but her thoughts went right into me. You are loved. You are cherished dearly forever. There's nothing to fear. I knew her face so well but I'd never met her in my life. This is the woman Eben saw. Her name is Betsy. After Eben was adopted, his biological parents went on to have more children, including Betsy. She died in 1998. What I'm doing here actually is giving you extracts of things. I don't expect people to sit in front of the computer for 20 minutes, half hour, or whatever amount of time that it takes to actually see the entire program, but I'm giving you an idea of what's on them. Ali, we're showing you the seven chakras you need the harness in 2016. It's a beginner's guide, so it's for everybody. But let's start with where we go when this life is over. One woman says she knows the answer. Take a look at what she saw when she crossed over. <laughs> In 2002, I was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma. I tried every kind of alternative therapy, but nothing seemed to work. I had tumors, some of them the size of lemons, that were from the base of my skull all around my neck. 
under my arms into my chest and my abdomen. On February the 2nd, 2006, I went into a coma. And that should have been the last day of my life because that was when the doctors told my family my organs were now shutting down. Unbeknownst to everybody around me, I could actually see and feel and hear everything that was happening around me. It was like I had 360 degree peripheral vision. And then I entered what felt like the most peaceful, beautiful realm. And I felt as though I was surrounded by beings. I first recognized my father. He said to me that my purpose is not complete. I felt that why would I choose to go back into such a sick body? And then it was in that moment that I realized if I chose to go back, my physical body would heal very, very quickly. I wanted to live my life fearlessly, and I also wanted to share with the world a little piece of that love that I felt in the other realm. Alina joins us in studio now. So your doctors had pretty much given up all hope. Yes. Yet you're sitting here. What's the status of your cancer, if I could ask? Well, at that time, this was 10 years ago, four days after I came out of the coma, the tumor shrunk by 60 to 70 percent. Hmm. Five weeks later, they could find no trace of cancer. Ten years later, I'm still cancer free. So I, uh... <laughs> So I'm going to have a couple of cases now. So anyway, uh, I had to change the battery right then, guys. But anyway, uh, the situation is, so I'm going to highlight a couple of cases. And there's thousands and thousands that could be highlighted. And of course, uh, nobody's got the time to look into all of this. But there's a couple of things that they could look at ex extracts or... Um, the entire program might not be too long so I'll put it on and uh, basically what happened as will be explained probably in this brief program uh, about 200 or so students and teachers at a Westall High School 50 years ago uh, were amazed to see two d discs silver discs floating about a foot or so above the ground and come down from the sky and landed, almost landed, as I said, were floating about a, mo uh, a foot above the ground, outside the school, and it would create an utter ca uh, chaos, as you can imagine. Um, there's a lot, it's a long story, there's a lot of things happened, uh, but the people, until this very day, are totally, of course, convinced that uh, indeed, Two of these two discs did land there, or nearly land there, as I said. Sat there for about 10 minutes in broad daylight, and then flew, flew off in a 45 degree angle or so. Flew off at an increasing speed into the clouds and away. So we know it's for real. and more than 200 students and a dozen teachers at two Melbourne schools are sure they've just had a close encounter. This is Australia's most famous UFO sighting. The object stayed on the ground for more than 20 minutes, then took off rapidly and some say it was buzzed by five aircraft. The school children were warned never to speak of it. Authorities telling them that flying saucers just don't exist. But 50 years later, witnesses insist they know exactly what they saw. It's incredible. It was called the Westall Incident. And joining us now, three of the people who were there when they were school children all those years ago. In Melbourne, Joy Clark and Terry Peck. And in Brisbane, Jackie Argent, and also with us in Canberra, principal researcher for this UFO incident, Shane Ryan. Good morning to all of you, and thanks for joining us. Let's begin with Joy and Terry in Melbourne. Can you tell us what you saw? Yes, Natasha. Um, I was out playing cricket on the Oval at the time, and 
we noticed these three craft hovering above the school, um, which was a bit unusual. They definitely weren't aircraft. And then after about 10 minutes, we saw one go down into an area behind our school called the Grange, where we used to do our cross country runs. So being a little bit of a rebel as I was at school, um, I was one of the first to run through and jump over the fence and arrive at the Grange and it was on the ground in front of me. The, the other two girls had arrived before me and one was hysterical, Tanya, and the other girl had fainted. So I just looked at it and after a few minutes it just raised up above me, probably to about well, 12 feet, turned on its side and went zoom straight up into the air and disappeared almost instantly. And there were two other craft in the air the time. Joy, did you see something similar and what were you thinking it was at that stage? Were you convinced it was a UFO? Look, uh, I didn't know what it was. I d yes, definitely a UFO. Um, I was actually in science class and we had a um, st student had rung in and flung the door open and said, Mr Greenwood, Mr Greenwood, there's things in the sky, there's flying saucers in the sky. So we all ran down the corridor and out onto the oval and yes, there were flying saucers in the sky. I saw three of them, um, but it took me quite a while to sort of comprehend what I was looking at because I'd never seen anything like that before. Jackie, it's quite um, intriguing. Did you also see those flying saucers? I saw a flying saucer. I don't recall there being more than one. Um, but we were down the back, I was down the back of the oval with Tanya when we noticed it in the sky. Um, it did some manoeuvres which were very strange, which is why our attention was drawn to it in the first place. And then it came down over the Grange. We could see it coming down, so we took off after it. <laughs> uh, Tanya mm. actually reached the craft, I believe. I didn't. Um, because she came back screaming towards me and then I ran back with her to the school. She got taken away in an ambulance and that was the last time I saw her. And, and can you tell us a bit more about these craft? What colour were they? How big were they? Did they actually land or were they just hovering above the ground? The craft I saw was silver in colour. It was round. It did come down on the ground. Even though I didn't see it on the ground, I saw the marks that it left. Um, later on that day, it could move incredibly fast and it could also s appear to stand still. When it took off from the other f aircraft that were buzzing it, um, it made them look as though they were at standstill. Right. And, and Shane, the sceptics have dismissed the event as just the product of the fertile imagination of children. Uh, what's your response to that? Some sceptics have, and there are other sceptics, I think, who take a more serious look at a story like this, a story which has so much witness testimony. Uh, I'd like to begin by paying tribute to Joy and Terry and Jackie and all the other witnesses who have been brave enough to come forward and talk about this story. 96 witnesses so far have been happy to talk to me about mm. the flying saucer that they saw. 147 people have come forward and spoken to me about the circles in the paddocks that were left behind by the flying saucer. So if you just look at those numbers alone, you realize we're looking at something pretty important. Now, remember, when we talk about UFOs, obviously in the general social conscious consciousness, people think about extraterrestrial craft. UFOs simply means unidentified flying objects. We don't know what an extra extraterrestrial spaceship, for example, would look like. Now, it just simply means something that was seen in the sky that nobody could easily identify. And I think we have to begin with that. Now, as interesting as a program as the X-Files is, and absolutely it is, I think this is a UFO story that all Australians need to uh, know about, need to take seriously. Can I ask what happened to the girl? You, um, you took her back to the school, the one that was hysterical. Is it Tanya? Mm -hmm. And um, she went into the hospital and then you went to visit her at her place and they said she didn't live there. That's yes, right. I, went to, I went to her house the following day and an English-speaking woman opened the door and said there had never been a Tanya living there. 
Now the problem with that is that Tanya's parents didn't speak English to start with. I think they were Yugoslavian. So I've been to this house a lot of times and then was told, no, sorry, you're mistaken. Oh my God, that's So what's gonna... happened to her? Do you know if she disappeared? Have you had any contact with her? Do you know where she is and what, what happened? I have had no personal contact with her. I know one of the researchers has. She prefers to stay anonymous and not be involved in anything at all. She told the researcher that she had no recall of what had happened. And then there was a very odd story about her parents putting her in a convent for some reason that was, to me, totally ridiculous. That's it. <laughs> Terry, we've seen drawings that look like a flying saucer and even two flying saucers. Can you describe for us what was there? Yes, um, it was about one and a half times the size of a normal um, family sedan and it was round, silver coloured. There were all lights around the bottom of it, no windows. Um, it threw off a bit of a heat and it was making a low buzzing sound. Did any of you at all witness anyone inside these unidentified flying objects? Did you see anyone? No. 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 All right, Joy, Terry, Jackie and Shane, stay with us because we're going to chat with you more uh, right after this short break. Now, we've heard firsthand from these accounts, but Australian authorities are actually accused of covering up what really happened. So what's the truth? Don't go anywhere. We'll turn it just a minute. <laughs> By journalists, reporters at the time, what has happened to your story since then and do you think there has been a cover-up? Oh, absolutely. Um, that film, I was interviewed by Channel 9 and at the front of the school and a man walked up to me. He was in blue, so he may have been Air Force or perhaps police, I'm not sure. Put his um, hand on my shoulder and told me to stop talking and go back into the school and then turned around to the film, uh, the cameraman and the reporter and told them both to go away. But previous to that happening, um, not long after the sighting, um, the army arrived opposite the school in three um, jeeps and jumped out of the back and they were in uh, camouflage gear and all that sort of stuff. So they were sort of out the school for quite a while. And then we had a, a special assembly. We were all called to a special assembly and told that we hadn't seen anything. It was another <laughs> the balloon. Yeah. We're all massively hysterical. Don't talk about it. If you talk about it, you'll get into trouble. And I got detention because I had been interviewed by Channel 9. Wow. Joy, let me ask you a little bit more about that. What, what would you say, because there might be people listening to your story uh, today and being a little sceptical and thinking, you're, you're a little girl, sometimes memories can change, even though we're convinced that we see a particular thing. And perhaps it was a weather balloon or oh, some oh dear. Um, other sort of aircraft and not necessarily a UFO. No, definitely a UFO. I'd never seen anything like it before. And we were used to seeing aircraft because we weren't that far away from Moorabbin Airport. So we would quite often see the little planes flying around. So we was nothing like I've ever seen ever since either. How old were you? Twelve and a half. Okay. And how soon after you saw the flying saucers did the uh, army and or possibly air force personnel show up? How quickly did they um, get there? I reckon probably 25, 30 minutes. Right. And Shane, do you think um, that this could have been uh, some kind of piece of military equipment or uh, some other type <laughs> of um, you know, apparatus that's perfectly innocent? Well, I take a, an agnostic view of, of UFOs and this particular UFO story included because we simply don't know. We don't know what UFOs are. But I think it's fairly obvious that it's difficult to find simply a, a prosaic, mundane explanation for what so many of these witnesses saw. It's easier for us to say what it wasn't. If you look at the evidence, if you sit down with the hundreds of witness testimonies... They're talking hundreds say, of witnesses. ...fairly confidently, this obviously wasn't an aeroplane. It wasn't a helicopter, it wasn't a drone, it wasn't a kite, and I don't mean to... The drones didn't away, exist at the time. It wasn't, to me, quite obviously, a meteorological balloon or anything like that. So then we're left with the mystery, 
what was it? Now remember, when we talk about UFO stories, it's often these days lights in the skies, people out in the outback seeing something while they're alone. This happened in broad daylight, literally hundreds of witnesses. And not only did the flying saucer fly low over two schools, in front of all these students and local workers and residents and some teachers, it landed. It was either on the ground or close to the ground for several minutes. And in addition to that, there was this incredible response to this incident. As Joy has Shades. mentioned, police, military and more. You, I understand you were a little sceptical at the start before you investigated this. Sure. And, and you seem also to be saying you're impressing that it's an unidentified flying object. And then you're calling it a flying saucer. Is it, do you think it's an alien craft? Do you think aliens were in there? Or are you sort of playing it safe here? Well, I'm trying to be rational, I'm trying to be logical, I'm trying to be fair to the evidence. I often like to refer to it as a flying source because that's what it was called at the time. It was called that because that's what it looked like. I saw the Civil Defence Organisation... Sorry, I interrupted by a phone call. ...this day. Why did they respond and why, in addition to that, is there no information about this incident publicly available in any of the government archives. They're some of the interesting questions. Terry, over the years you've heard what authorities have said about this incident. How do you feel about what they say about it? Well, look, it's, it's hard to know. Jessica's right in a way. Over the many years our memories do change a little bit, but it is burned into my memory. Um, I know what I saw and no matter what anyone says, I know that it was something very unusual and the way it took off at that speed, I doubt very much if there was anything in that day that could take off like that. Shane, you claim you've spoken to more than a hundred witnesses. Why do you think there was a cover-up, it seems, at very, very high levels? Well, that's the $94 million question, I guess. We do know that a very high-ranking public servant from the Department of Supply was dispatched to Westall that day. He investigated. And so we had a department uh, spokesman coming there to investigate a weather balloon. Oh, okay. History was aired on Australian television in 2010. His daughter contacted me and said, "Thank you, thank you for having that documentary made because my father was there that day, and he suffered for what he saw. Mm. And she and her brother, I've spoken to them both, really believe that his untimely death, just four years later." was connected with the stress that was applied to him because he tried to get answers to what happened. Why the cover-up? What could it possibly have been 50 years ago that would now be a threat to national security or anybody's reputation or any alliance with another country? Is that possible after 50 years? This is uh, another extract of a story that um as the USSR relaxed its media stranglehold in the late 1980s, it was finally That's revealed that UFOs were seen behind the Iron Curtain, as well as in the West. One of the first and easily most bizarre UFO stories to make headlines was the landing in Voronezh, Russia in 1989. The case contains elements of both traditional UFO sightings and much older anomalous experiences, and proves that UFO landings aren't just inventions of American pop culture, but part of an enduring global phenomenon. On September 27, 1989, three children at South Park in the Russian city of Voronezh noticed a pink light in the sky that turned into a dark red ball as it got closer. It was about five to nine meters wide and moving in their direction. Vasya Surin, Genya Blinov, and Julia Sholakova watched the ball as it approached and hovered in circles about 12 meters over the park. The children could see grass being disturbed under the sphere as it moved. Suddenly, the sphere floated away and returned a few minutes later. By this time, a crowd of about 40 adults had gathered and watched as a small hatch opened on the bottom of the sphere. A three-eyed creature peered through the opening. After briefly scanning the terrain, the creature disappeared back inside and the object landed in the park. To the shock of the witnesses, a door opened up on the bottom of the sphere and the creature, or another similar one, walked out into the park with a bizarre, boxy robot. The creature wore silvery overalls, bronze boots, and a large disc on its chest. 
It had a wide but small domed head that rested directly on its shoulders, and two white eyes with a red one in between them. The children guessed the being to be nearly three meters tall. The creature uttered something, and a glowing rectangle appeared on the ground in front of it. He uttered another phrase, causing it to disappear. He then adjusted something on the robot, which caused it to start walking away. Terrified, a boy in the crowd began to scream, but was paralyzed when the being turned in his direction. Mm. Light shot from the creature's eyes as it locked its gaze on the boy, causing the crowd to panic. At that instant, the sphere, the robot, and the being simply disappeared. Five minutes later, the visitors reappeared, but this time the being had a meter-long tube in his hand. He pointed it at a 16-year-old boy standing nearby, causing him to disappear entirely. Peace. The creature then climbed back inside the landed craft. The spear ascended and flew off into the sky, and the teenager reappeared. A team of Soviet scientists investigated the original South Park landing, finding identical impressions in a diamond shape, and several deep clean holes in the ground. Hmm. The soil beneath an area of flattened grass had turned the consistency of stone. Based on the shape and depth of the depressions, Dr. Yuri Lasovsets estimated the object that landed to be as heavy as 11 tons. The police investigated the incident, and the National Soviet Information Agency, TASS, reported on it, though they usually ignored anomalous reports. Newspapers took interest in the story, and reporters quickly discovered there were thousands of other sightings of red spheres and landings between the 21st and 29th of September. All took place between 6 and 9 p.m. Most involved only the glowing sphere. Some involved the three-eyed alien and robot. Some even involved short, grayish-green creatures in blue, loose-fitting overcoats. In the U.S., the St. Louis Dispatch picked up the story, and it was soon reported on by the New York Times. Western media generally reported that the object had only been witnessed by children, however, and did not draw much attention to earlier sightings. The same sources often reported that there were two alien creatures present at the South Park landing, when in reality there was only one. Under its strange veneer, the Baronage incident contains elements common to some unlikely anomalous experiences. First is the use of a tube-like instrument and its ability to paralyze onlookers. Similar handheld devices are a common element in UFO stories, and they're often used to affect witnesses from a distance. A French farmer named Maurice Maas was paralyzed in 1965 after a short being that emerged from a landed saucer pointed a small straight instrument in its direction.